In 2013, I grabbed my tools and I walked down to a local community hub, a local community formerly blighted lot that we came together and we built into something with sheds and benches and a place for people to gather, meet, exchange ideas and exchange skills. And I offered to start fixing people's bikes for free. I went up to the woman who was running things and I said, hey, do you need somebody to, to help teach people how to fix their bikes? And she said, I didn't know I needed somebody to do that. Uh -huh. um, but you're here and I love it and come down and start. And that's pretty much uh, what I did. Um, it was a volunteer run exercise. I put out my tools in my repair stand and a sign that said bicycle repair and people just started trickling in. This evening's co-presenters. Kathy Cotteridis is the executive director of Historic Boston Incorporated, a nonprofit that redevelops at-risk historic buildings in order to help Boston's neighborhoods thrive. Noah Hicks is the bike, bike repair entrepreneur and also bike building entrepreneur, as we saw earlier, um, whose business will soon occupy the former Upham's Corner Comfort Station. Please join me in welcoming Kathy and Noah. So first, thank you very much to Old South Meeting House for inviting us, but also thinking about um, places like Upham's Corner and the outlying neighborhoods of Boston for a discussion about historic preservation and what the rehabilitation of challenging but really important buildings can actually mean for the, the lives that people are living today in Boston's neighborhoods. And that really is um, one of the stories that we hope you leave here today um, having learned a little bit more about, and that is that historic preservation can be a very valuable tool for preserving places, architecture, heritage, but also just that sense of character and uniqueness of each one of our neighborhoods. So that's um, certainly the theme of Preservation Month, but um, it should also be something that's illustrated with this small little um, palace, is what I like to call it, but this small historic building in Upham's Corner. I think we'd also like to focus a little bit about on how preservation also creates a platform for economic development and making investments like this in fact create space for um, new opportunities, uh, existing businesses to expand into. In fact, they, they simply create um, an opportunity through their reactivation for um, new ideas and new opportunities. And I think you'll learn today that a nonprofit collaboration is putting this together and that by virtue of um, working on the, um, this particular preservation project that uh, these two nonprofits, Historic Boston Incorporated, which I work at, and a combination of the Sip and Spoke Bike Kitchen, which will operate here, but also the Bowdoin Bike School, which Noah um, has both founded and is assembling, um, that our col collaboration is, is quite creative. Um, and it's pretty progressive and that by virtue of working together from our very different vantage points, we are um, creating just the right formula to take a building that's very distressed and put it back into use again. Um, and by virtue of doing um, all of that, I think we're also helping, I'd like to think that we're helping a, a the, the very powerful movement of cycling in the city, but really in the, the work that Noah is doing in, in Dorchester in particular amongst youth um, in helping to um, kickstart, uh, well, that, that his emphasis on training, um, opportunity, access to transportation, access to healthy food in this case, and also a good cup of coffee, which is all important, um, that all of those are really kickstarting this project in Upham's Corner in Dorchester, but also has the opportunity to send ripples out into the rest of the commercial district and the immediate environment, both socially, but also physically in terms of the neighborhood. But let's jump into it um, and introduce you to the Upham's Corner Comfort Station, a 1912 um, historic building in the neighborhood or the business district of Upham's Corner in the neighborhood of, of Dorchester. The, um, today you're gonna hear from a combination of uh, perspectives around um, youth cycling and uh, some important work that is going on um, around that through both the Sip and Spoke Bike Kitchen and the Bowdoin Bike School, and from more of that from NOAA, but we're gonna focus on 
This building, um, which looked really nice in the rendering before, but um, is really in pretty tough shape, but in a great location. And it's hard to see with the shading here, but this is Columbia Road, and, and the comfort station is sitting right there in the shadows. Um, and this assembly in the middle is really the, the core of Upham's Corner and the neighborhood commercial district. Um, I represent Historic Boston and just a 30-second message about who we are. Um, the organization was founded in 1960 to save a building kitty corner from where we sit today, the old corner bookstore, which was threatened for demolition in, the in 1960, actually. Um, and uh, a group of Bostonians got together and uh, purchased the building and put it back into use for what it had always been, which is a commercial structure. We are a nonprofit organization, but our mission is to redevelop historic buildings for new uses and, and with large focus on the properties that, are, are, that a private developer or private development cannot undertake. And typically these are some that are, are very fragile but important pieces of architecture that have um, suffered from either deferred maintenance um, or other um, distresses uh, and, and need attention by an organization that can, um, has both the patience and, and some resources to put toward them. Today, although for many years we were in the Old Corner Bookstore, um, which is across the way, we now are in Roxbury in Dudley Square where we are located in the Eustis Street Firehouse. I've 1859 firehouse, the oldest remaining firehouse in the city, which um, we redeveloped about seven years ago, um, going from this very unstable structure to a place that's now really a highly regarded um, property and place for um, folks in, in Dudley Square. And we've been working all over the city. We are citywide and, and uh, with a major focus, however, on neighborhood commercial districts, which brings us um, to Upham's Corner. Um, but you'll recognize some spots here in Roslindale. Um, the Alva Kittredge House in Roxbury, the Vertulo Building in Hyde Park, way down in Hyde Park, um, and uh, the enthusiasm I hope you'll see in some of these photographs that communities um, experience or are really um, excited about when preservation in their communities um, is, uh, is a priority and when we can deliver on it. But let's go to Upham's Corner, which is um, a place that is important to historic Boston because it's a neighborhood commercial district that has risen high on our um, radar screen. It's also a, um, a neighborhood that is very important to municipal officials. Right now, it's the focus of the Boston 2030 plan. It's not the only focus, but it, it's a priority area for investment. Um, and it is a, a, a very, and it has historically been a major center for Dorchester, um, both a, a physical crossroads where transportation systems and streetcars came through, but it's also a major um, uh, arterial, or sits on a major arterial into the city of Boston, Columbia Road. If you've ever gone from the zoo um, in Franklin Park down to the beaches in South Boston, this is your most direct route. So a lot of cars come through here. It's a busy place, um, but it's also been uh, the center of uh, a, a neighborhood that has um, over time had some experiences, some disinvestment and, and some challenges demographically, and yet it's beginning to turn a corner. Um, physically speaking, there are many 19th century buildings in this neighborhood, like Fox Hall, that um, represent opportunities for development and, and new uses. Um, and you can see the Columbia Road corridor here. But this is also the place with the early 20th century Strand Theater, a, a beautiful performance in vaudeville theater um, that is still used and operated by the city of Boston and, and private performance groups. Um, and then up here, you'll see the comfort station. This little red square um, is where this, the building that we'll discuss tonight is located. And around it is um, the extraordinary and a very important 1630 Dorchester North Burying Ground, where at least three centuries of Dorchester residents were interred. Um, some very famous and some not so famous, but some really beautiful um, gravestones and a really important and large landscape in the middle of a commercial district. A little bit, this is a little bit more evident here with the burying ground our little itty bitty Upham's Corner Comfort Station there and the concentration in blue mostly 
of commercial structures in typical downtown buildings, many from the 19th century through to the early 20th century. This is the building, um, and as you can see, it's uh, had better times. It's uh, been owned by the city of Boston for many years, and when uh, they put it out for development, Noah had, as a native Dorchester um, person, uh, had his eye on this and said, you know, we should, uh, th this might be where the vision that we have of a combined um, bicycle repair shop and coffee shop um, might actually take off in. Um, and the uh, city of Boston put it out for an RFP looking for developers, and we were crazy enough to go after this um, and were designated as a team. Now, the team, um, is, uh, well, just to emphasize crazy, sorry, I was going to switch this slide on, the, on that word. The, this, if, it's a little hard to see here, but this is the rear of the building. Um, you can see a little bit of the tile on the roof still remaining, but a very deteriorated chimney, um, lots of stucco that's falling off. It was bathrooms, I'll get to that in a second, for the public up until 1977, but has been closed since then. So. This really represents the level of um, deterioration over that period of time. Um, so you can assume there are big challenges here, both financially and technically. Um, but the group that came together to work with Noah on his vision of a, um, a bicycle shop and a coffee shop were um, Historic Boston as developer. In other words, we would be the ones who bring our development talents and our preservation talents to the table. But we work closely with the American City Coalition, um, which has provided NOAA with some business guidance and access to technical assistance um, around business planning and testing of the markets around this neighborhood to see what, whether coffee and bicycles um, would do well here. Naturally, we had to have an operator and an end user, almost the most important thing in any real estate, and that's NOAA. Um, and Util Architecture and Planning um, has provided the designs that you'll see today. And our, we've just recently chosen a contractor to actually take this project on, which we expect to start this summer, and that's um, MJ Mon. But why do we really value this building? It was built in 1912. Um, and that's a, a, an important time in this neighborhood and, and in the city as well, because in the latter half of the 19th century, latter quarter really, Boston grew exponentially, not just through immigration, but through the assembly of some of the towns around it. So Dorchester, in which Upham's Corner is located, um, was uh, added to the city effectively in the uh, 1870s. I think it's 70s, yes. Um, so that the population of the city and the need for access between the places where people lived and downtown Boston and the work centers um, grew and the, certainly population grew. And so streetcars became very important as a way to um, provide public transportation to people. This building was built to support the streetcars. It was a public restroom from the get-go. It's very hard when you're trying to sell people on the idea of redeveloping a place to say it was a bathroom. But the fact is, I think that all by itself is very significant, and it is part of the story here. And that is that y you have a, a sweet building here that when it was built, um, you can see here the transportation system on the streetcars passing by, the little comfort station right there, and, and even more um, of a presence here once the cars are out of the way. Um, and this is a, a view caught in action when the Pope visited us in, in 1979. I mean, I was amazed to find that. It, it almost felt like a blessing. Um, but I tell you this because in, in the early 20th century, many things were going on. Certainly, we were building a, um, and expanding a public transportation system through the development of a streetcar system. But we were also um, expanding considerably and expanding at, with people who were coming from all corners of the world. And, and, our, um, and really public amenities were absent for the, the number of people who were um, coming in, uh, such as public bathrooms and things like that. So this really represented a time when the city was examining itself and, and asking itself what did it mean to be a city that was um, was prepared to serve the, the people living in it, but was also um, a good city, a beautiful city. And the city beautiful movement, which um, if you read about, uh, really 
uh, reinforced things like this, the idea that you would have a public restroom um, in a, um, right on the public way. Uh, so this was built and is unusual for Boston. It's, it has a tile roof in 1912, a red tile roof. Um, it's stucco, very unlike anything else in Upham's Corner, but I can't think of many places like this in Boston except maybe a few residences. Um, but not too far away is a firehouse um, for Upham's Corner that is also of this era and of this design. So you can see that the city fathers were beginning to think about how, the, um, how design was going to influence the, the, um, the health and, and, and experience of the, the city as it grew. Um, it, it's also, though, the, um, an unusual placement. I don't know of any, many other places that where a building like this is built by the city for what was a regional transportation or state transportation system. Um, and so it's always been in the hands of the city of Boston, and they are the ones who put it out for development for us to consider. And again, some views of Upham's Corner looking up toward the major center of, of commerce and the banks and such, and then looking away down Columbia Road toward South Boston here. But I, I want to reiterate the, the fact that his, for historic Boston to succeed at preserving a building, we always ask first, who's going to use this thing? Um, because really one of the best ways of not just preserving a building and getting through the restoration, but also knowing that you will have a sustainable um, property, both um, in terms of its condition, but also its um, ongoing performance, is to have a really good tenant. And we've been really fortunate to be working with Noah and his team at the um, Sip and Spoke Bike Kitchen and the American City Coalition in putting together what we think is a fabulous vision um, for restoring this building and reactivating it uh, for a modern transportation need. I'm going to turn it over here to Noah. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start at the beginning, or at least the beginning for me, uh, 1986. I was born in <laughs> Boston, Massachusetts, to a Dorchester family, actually right in the neighborhood, right along the Columbia Road corridor. Uh, and to be frank and to be honest, I was mad about cycling from the very beginning. Uh, it was almost like I could pedal before I could walk. Uh, bikes were very, very important to me from a very early age, and that's why I do what I do. I would like to have a part in changing the way that people get around and changing the way that people move and opening up cycling accessibility to everyone. And that's pretty much the mission of my work with Bowdoin Bike School and that is the mission of the space that we're going to create with the Sip and Spoke Bike Kitchen. Um, this is such an important opportunity for me, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna start with I'm gonna start with where where Bowdoin Bike School began. In 2013, I grabbed my tools and I walked down to a local community hub, a local community formerly blighted lot that we came together and we built into something with sheds and benches and a place for people to gather, meet, exchange ideas, and exchange skills. And I offered to start fixing people's bikes for free. I went up to the woman who was running things and I said, hey, do you need somebody to, to help teach people how to fix their bikes? And she said, I didn't know I needed somebody to do that, uh, um, but you're here and I love it and come down and start. And that's pretty much uh, what I did. Um, it was a volunteer-run exercise. I put out my tools in my repair stand and a sign that said bicycle repair, and people just started trickling in. Um, it was mostly youth who gravitated towards the space, mostly youth who made us viable, and mostly youth who have gotten us to where we are today. Uh, they were our first volunteers, and they came, and the agreement was that if we invested the time in teaching them the skill set that they need to fix their own bikes, they would invest some of their time in teaching other people how to fix their bikes. And that's what we did. Um, the purposes of us 
doing it or of me doing it was that I love my community more than anything else. And I saw that my community was not as healthy or as wealthy as it could be. I see cycling and I see the bicycle as a way of keeping your body, your mind, and your community healthy. Um, tackling some of the health disparities facing us. Um, you know, we're just miles from the downtown area and our health outcomes are horrible. Um, as well as the fact that um, transit, access to public transit, the ability to afford and maintain a car is not equal and available to everybody. Um, so this is where the idea was actually born. Um, we took, you know, basically dirt and tools, and we started to build a community meeting space, some place where people came together. Yes, we were coming together around bikes, but we were coming together. And somebody said, wouldn't it be cool if we had like a sit-down cafe where we also could work on bikes? And um, I said, yeah, that would be cool. Somebody should do that. And, and so for a while, it was just an idea until the opportunity came up to start our own brick and mortar bike shop. Um, we did that. Uh, we took a formerly abandoned two-car garage on a side street in the neighborhood, and we turned it into a bicycle shop. The very same young people who came out and started to volunteer with us and learn and give freely of their time now had paid positions. They were now employees of Boat and Bike School. And we, we started to operate saying, yes, this is fun, it's great, it's wonderful to run a business, but if we're going to be viable and we're going to succeed, we're going to need to build the kind of cycling community that's going to sustain us. We're gonna to have to build the kind of meeting space that's going to sustain us, and that's what we did. Um, we sponsored a series of community bike rides to try to take away some of the fear and some of the stigma of riding in the streets. We offer reasonably priced bicycles and repairs uh, at a rate that honestly is accessible to the neighborhood and uh, something that you can't find elsewhere. Uh, our, our entire goal and our motto is just to put more butts on bikes. And that's what we've been doing for these last years, in the last couple of years, in addition to working on bringing the comfort station along, we've been building the kind of community that's going to make the Sip and Spoke Bike Kitchen great. Um, right now, we actually have a pop-up shop right across the street from the Sip and Spoke Bike Kitchen. You can come and visit us. You can visit the Spoke House anytime. Um, we sell a community-conscious brand 1854 cycling and apparel. Once again, this is about expanding the movement to people who otherwise would not be included. So our goal in our current population that 1854 benefits is the formerly incarcerated population, particularly women. The next step, and we can't wait for this, but the next step is to have our cafe, finally. Um, like I just mentioned, I work in the neighborhood, and there are plenty of places to eat and not very many places to eat healthy. Um, so this is an opportunity to, to have both a bike shop and a cafe in one space, be able to sit down and enjoy a meal, and grab and go healthy, convenient, and affordable locally sourced food. The spaces will be very, very flexible, and much like what we do now where we have classes and we have workshops in our, and we have events, we're going to be equipped to do all this. All of this furniture moves out of the way so we can have, we can have piano nights, we can have fix your own bike tutorials where I set up and I do a tutorial and I talk to the people in this cafe. We're not going to think of it as just a place to grab a cup of coffee, it's also a place to grab a cup of community. There we go. And it's actually opening up the sidewalk. This is honestly a quiet and neglected corner of the neighborhood. There's not very much that goes on there. And there's not very much patio activity or any kind of walkability in this little corner. We're instantly going to change that. We're going to make this a vibrant, colorful corner of the community. And bikes and coffee are going to be in a, bikes, coffee, and excellent food are going to be an essential part of doing that. Um, well, that's the end of my slideshow, but not the end of my talk.
Um, uh, I would actually like to encourage you all to find out more about us. If you're on social media, you should follow the Sip and Spoke Bike Kitchen. We're actually in the middle of a fundraising campaign right now. We're nearing the end. Um, we're very much looking forward to reactivate the site that was made to serve everyone. That's part of the thing about a public rest stop. It's for everyone. And we wanted to come up with a business idea that was relevant to the community's needs. So when the American City Coalition went out and researched what the community wanted to see, um, a cafe was very, very high on our list of priorities, and we can bring that. Every day at work, we have people walk in um, to the pop-up shop and say, oh, I'm so glad you're here. This is exactly what this community needs. This is exactly what this community needs. A bike shop, that's what I'm talking about. Um, and we're so close to the culmination of this dream. We're so close to making this come together. I really encourage you to go to sipandspoke.com and find out more about us and support our work. Uh, thank you very much. You, you gonna join me up here, Kathy? I am. Let's... I got you back, but over here. <laughs> just want to ask, are, are you planning to teach people how to ride bikes? So we, that... are, we already do that. We have a couple of clinics a year. We have a couple of clinics a year where we teach, teach people how to ride bikes. We've done bike rodeos for the very, very small in the past, where we, where we go out to different community events. We're going to be a bike shop and a cafe without walls. So we're going to go out and to different community events and teach people how to ride bikes, but we'd also like to put something together specifically for women, adult women who don't know how to ride bikes yet. Um, and yeah, absolutely. Bic bicycle ridership clinics are on the menu. What's the time frame for the project? I think you're starting the summer, and then how long is it going to take to get to the vision? S right now, we're charging forward on a schedule that would have us going by before the end of July. So the, the idea, that we more or less got all of our um, permitting done, except for building permit, and that's, that requires a couple things. There's a little sequence to all of that. But all the things that we would need to, that would take a long time are done. We're at 90% drawings. We will be ready to go. We are still raising money, though. Um, it, this has not been a, a simple project. It's a $1.4 million dollar um, project and uh, we still have a gap of probably about um, well I think we're feeling pretty good that with another hundred and fifty thousand dollars we will sleep well at night yeah and I do encourage you all to spread the word on the fundraising co campaign if you go to sip and spoke sip and spoke dot com uh, you'll, you'll find more information on where we are with our fundraising progress and what we're in the middle of doing now uh, no, I hope I didn't miss it, but did you mention, right now, Noah's in the middle of a, a group, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, is in the middle of a um, crowd sourcing or crowdfunding uh, campaign, that if you do go to his site, right, you would be able to participate in that. Yeah, patronicity, we're, we're, actually, we're actually in the running um, for not just, not just a really awesome um, fundraising push, but also a match, a one-to-one -one match. So every dollar that you or someone you know gives to the campaign is, is, is matched by mass development. But, but that said, if we're, um, on, if we're correct and we can start before the end of July and, and all things look good that way, um, we should be ready to, to open or Noah should be able to move in in January or February. It's, it's a fairly quick topic. Is there a zoo bike? Oh, blue bike. Yes. <laughs> Actually, that's one of the really cool things about having a pop-up shop in the neighborhood. Uh, the fact that there are people who are getting into cycling because they're taking advantage of blue bike, which some of you may still know as Hubway. Um, and there's actually one right on, the proper, right on the property right now where these bikes are lined up right, ne right here in the slideshow. That's actually a blue bike station. So people are coming, they're interested, they're interested in cycling. I get to talk to people and have these face-to-face -face interactions. That's what's awesome about being such an integral part of the neighborhood, the fact that you can do that. Do you, as part of, one of the things that, that 
I think about and it concerns me with the urban biking is with the with the bike borrowing is that I think it, it encourages people to be riding without helmets often and wondering how you do you deal with that kind of level of kind of safety issues as part of your oh my goodness um, when when I retire and go into academia, inner city, um, inner city helmet usage is going to be what I write my thesis on. Um, because <laughs> there are all kinds of cultural barriers to people, cultural and practical barriers to people adhering to helmet usage. Um, and we do everything possible to get people riding um, and riding with helmets. I'm a recent convert. I'm actually an adult convert to helmet usage. Um, I've only been riding with a helmet for four years now, and it was as a condition of me getting this ring was that <laughs> <laughs> was, was that I would actually would, would actually reconsider it. And actually, no. Um, when when I started the bike school, um, something about something about trying to preach helmet usage without actually practicing what I preach started to ring hollow, and I started to almost always wear my helmet. Um, and now I'm a, I'm a, every time I hop on a bike, I have on a helmet. Um, but we've done, we've primed and painted um, helmets with youth before. Mm. We've set up anything to encourage and get helmets to be cool um, is, is, is something that we do. We give, we, we give away helmets um, as well um, through the city. Um, they have a wonderful program there where they partner with bike shops to offer five dollar helmets we have a five dollar suggested donation but honestly um i push helmets at every opportunity that that i can and you'll be happy to know that when you see a lot of the people going to catch the hubway bikes they're carrying helmets with them from home which i think is really cool do you know at all if that same stand is still going to be there once you guys move in i know that those stands are kind of movable but yeah, the city has been a really good partner in terms of placing those. They actually placed them, um, they asked beforehand whether it would be an okay place to put them, and I thought it's, I thought it's excellent. I thought it brings mm -hmm. a lot of attention and activity to the space and, and cycling in the neighborhood. So just the same way that they've been excellent about that, I'm, I'm pretty sure when we're ready to get up and going, they'll move to another, another location. We don't view them, we don't view them, it, cycling is like, uh, cycling is like, I don't want to say a drug. I want to talk about <laughs> something more addictive than drugs. Cycling is like chocolate. Um, you have a little piece and you get hooked. So I love the fact that Hubway slash Blue Blacks gets people out and gets them cycling. Eventually, yeah, and eventually, eventually it won't be enough and they'll just come in and buy a bike. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you.